Okay, let's uh, get started. Welcome to lecture number 10 of, of this course. Um, today we are going to talk about applications of vendors decomposition, specifically uh, its applications to power and energy systems. Um, yesterday in the last lecture, we talked about the fundamentals of vendors decomposition. And today we like to see how we can, I mean, the different problems in power and energy systems, a few of them that we can implement vendors. Um, so here you see it's 10A. Uh, it means that, well, also I have some uh, supplementary slides about uh, nested vendors. So I'll see if the time uh, allows or not, if, if uh, we, we can manage also I'll talk about nested vendors today. Otherwise, uh, I'll skip it. It's it's optional. And about this lecture, I would like to thank my uh, former colleague at DTU, uh, uh, Anna Ishvile. Uh, she was uh, a PhD student at DTU and uh, graduated uh, two three months ago. And uh, yeah, she prepared the first draft of this slides and and taught. Uh, this lecture in uh, one of the previous versions of this course, and I used her slides to prepare this lecture. So, so I have to appreciate her. Good. So, um, hopefully, today after this session, you will uh, you will be able to recognize the the, the composable structure of uh, yeah different problems, specifically stochastic optimization problem. And you will manage to, to identify the number of complicating variables or uh, uh, yeah, in, the, in this case, complicating variables because we are gonna talk about vendors and the number of subproblems. And hopefully you will manage to see how, I mean, we can write vendors decomposition algorithm for a general stochastic optimization problem and how can we solve uh, uh, stochastic market clearing as an example using vendors decomposition. Good. So I have to mention that, uh, well, this is the first paper, seminal uh, paper by, by Benders, uh, published in 1962 that uh, proposed uh, Benders algorithm. So always it's good to, to see uh, the first paper that developed uh, a very efficient algorithm. Good, this is um, exercise number three of our last lecture. It's about uh, investment problem. It's a very simple problem. Um, we have two existing uh, generation uh, units and one candidate. So we are uh, determining how much, uh, what the optimal um, capacity of the new generator should be. It's uh, investment cost or capital cost is $15,000 per megawatt. And then we have the operational cost uh, in different hours. So this is why we have index H, which is index for hour. And we have three generators with different uh, production costs. Here, the production cost of the candidate unit is 20, which is a bit different, slightly different than the previous example in, in, in example in the previous lecture. So we have the generation limit uh, limits for existing units and the generation limit for candidate unit to be invested. And then we have power balance equality, the total production is equal to total demand, there is no network. And of course, our capacity expansion, our capacity decision is a non-negative variable. Good. So we already talked in the, in the previous lecture that we have one complicating variable, right? X3 is our complicating variable because if we fix it, we can decompose the original problem to, to a set of subproblems one per hour. So we have only one complicating variable X3, which appeared in objective function and in constraints. And uh, the number of subproblems is one per hour. So if we fix X3 in the objective function, we can uh, remove the, uh, the term. And then this is X3 fixed now. Also, we have to fix X3 to a non-negative value. So we can remove this constraint. We don't have it anymore. So we have these constraints one per hour. We have the objective function term one per hour. So we can 
decompose the original problem to, to a set of subproblems one per hour. But how to write the formulation of subproblem? Uh, let's see. So in subproblem, we first of all we have one subproblem per hour. So we have one problem, let's say per hour. Okay. So what about the objective function? We don't have expansion cost anymore because it's fixed. So we can remove it. We don't have the sum operator over H anymore because we decomposed the subproblem per hour. So we have just the total operational cost of the system, which is the total production cost of three generators in the corresponding hour. And superscript I means uh, we are at iteration I. And uh, we have uh, uh, the, the existing, sorry, the, the, the generation limit of existing um, um, uh, generators. So we use the compact form of vendors. So it means that uh, X3 though is treated as a variable, right? But we fixed its value to a given uh, parameter, X3 fixed, which is its uh, given value in iteration I. And uh, yeah, we have the same power balance uh, equality and we have this fixing constraint and lambda h, it's, it's uh, corresponding dual variable. Is it clear so far? Just a problem? Very good. If it's clear, then I have a question for you. Since it's clear, so, so we have just one constraint. <laughs> uh, we have only one fixing constraint. It's not, it's a unique fixing constraint, but it's corresponding dual variable. It got index H. Is it wrong or is it correct? The constraint is unique, but it's dual variable took index H. Is it wrong or is it correct? Should it be lambda or should it be lambda h? Direct says uh, it's correct because there is one subproblem per hour. Exactly. Goran said uh, it will be the same for all hours, but one per subproblem. Uh, yes, I'm not sure, Goran, it's correct because in different hours, uh, the demand is different. So the productions may different. So I'm not sure that the value of dual variable will be the same over the hours, right? Uh, Carolina said we will need one Lambda for each sub problem for the master problem. Okay, let's not talk about master problem. Just, just focus to this sub problem. Is it correct to have one Lambda per hour? Remember, uh, please uh, uh, recall the definition of, of dual variable is the sensitivity of objective function with respect to any perturbation in the corresponding constraint, right? So yes, of course, the corresponding constraint is unique, but the objective function is not unique. Objective function is our dependent. So this is why the corresponding sensitivity or dual variable, it's our dependent. Does it make sense? Yes, very good. Okay, good. So for example, if we, our subproblems are one per scenario, then our corresponding dual, uh, sorry, fixing uh, the, the the dual variable of corresponding fixing constraint needs to also be scenario dependent. But what about the master problem? Master problem looks like this. I will explain it one by one, term by term, but maybe you can spend one minute just for yourself to try and interpret what it is, but I will explain it later.
Is there anyone that who can help me to interpret this problem? Any volunteer to unmute and explain what the objective function is, what the constraints are? A volunteer? So, so uh, one can unmute and explain what this term is, what this term is, what this term is, what this term is, and so on. If not, I can explain, but maybe you, you would also like to try. Okay, let, let's move on. I, I can explain. Uh, this is the formulation of the master problem. Whose variables are the complicating variable and one auxiliary variable, only one auxiliary variable. Even if we have 10 complicating variables, still we have only one auxiliary variable. And all of them, they have superscript i referring to iteration i. The first term, it comes from the original objective function. So if you remember the original objective function or objective function of the original problem has um, expansion cost. So it's exactly the same. What about alpha? What does alpha represent? Can you help me? What does this auxiliary variable represent? Alpha is our attempt to minimize the master problem to hit the current uh, lower bound. Yes. So if you compare the objective function of master problem to, with objective function of the original problem, what does alpha represent? Uh, Sahan said in the chat box, sum of the objective functions of all subproblems. Exactly. So if you remember in the original objective function, instead of alpha, we had sum of all operational costs. So sum costs for all generators, right? In iteration i. Very good. So i here represents the total operational cost of the system for all hours in iteration i. So if we assume that we start with a <clears throat> master problem um, then we need to, so in the first iteration, we don't have a cut. So then we need to have uh, a lower bound for alpha to avoid having unbounded solution. Uh, the last constraint comes from the original problem. So it's an original constraint. So let's now focus about the bender's optimality cut, right? So alpha is our auxiliary variable. Yesterday we explained, we talked why it should be greater than or equal to <clears throat> because it somehow it represents weak uh, duality. So what is this term? Is it given or is it variable? Yes, it's given because it comes from previous iterations K. So it's given. And what does it this this term is? What 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 is this term? Yes, it's given, but what is it? Yes, it's the total operational cost of the system in iteration k, in previous iteration k. Exactly. Good. So it's the value of all uh, the, the total value of, of, of objective functions of all sub problems. Good, nice. So as you see here, again, uh, the lambda comes with index h. So we have one sensitivity per subprop. Is this lambda given or variable? Is it, is it variable lambda or is it given? It's given because it comes from previous iteration k. Very good. And the last term is the difference of 
complicating variable, the value of complicating variable in the current iteration and in previous iterations. So the first one, is it variable or is it given? It's variable. What about the other one? It's given, it's parameter. Very nice. Good. If I had the second complicating variable, if I had, then just I add, I, I needed to add another term to the, 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 the objective function. So it should be plus sum over h. This time, instead of lambda, let's say mu k. If, for example, our complicating variable was y, it could be y in iteration i minus y in iteration k, if we had the second complicating variable. So always we are adding one cut per iteration, regardless how many complicating variables we have. Is it clear? If you're right, it's clear, I can continue, very good. Very nice. So as I explained, this is expansion cost. Lambda represents the uh, summation of objective function of all sub problems. Oops. So this term is given. Uh, it comes from the previous iteration K and it's the sum of objective function and value of all sub problems. Lambda is a dual variable or also we can call it sensitivity. It's one per hour or one per sub problem and uh, it's given. And this term is difference of the value of the complicating variable in the current iteration, which is variable and the previous iteration, which is prompt. Good, so what is the uh, algorithm? Well, uh, we, we go for initialization. It means that we need a given uh, value or initial guess for uh, X. So because of that, we first start with sub problem. Uh, we solve all sub problems, one per hour. We check the convergence, right? We, we check the difference of alpha and the total operational cost of the system for all hours. If it's converged, uh, done. If not, uh, we go uh, next iteration and we solve for given sensitivities, we solve master problem. So master problem updates the value of complicating variable and we repeat this process. So I hope it's clear. So how to know that we get, uh, we, we, I mean, the, the algorithm has converged. It's just simple. You have to only check the value of alpha, which is a variable in master problem. It's the lower bound and the total value of the objective function of, I mean, all objective functions of, ah, the total objective function of all sub problems in the current iteration, just you need to check them. Also, as you check, this, this, this uh, expansion cost is, uh, is common in both lower and upper bound. So, so it's up to you to add it or not. Also, you can ignore it. It's up to you. So the, this is the lower bound and this is the upper bound. And if they are close enough with the accuracy of epsilon, then the algorithm has converged. Any question? So now let's talk a little about the applications of Bender's decomposition to two-stage scenario-based stochastic program. If it's three-stage or multi-stage, then we need nested Bender's. So I hope I'll, I'll have time after this lecture to also talk about uh, nested Bender's. Nested Bender's. It's an uh, algorithm if our uh, stochastic program has more than two stages. But so far, let's assume that our stochastic program has only two stages, first stage and recursive stage or second stage. Good. And this is the representation of uh, scenario three for a two-stage stochastic program, first stage and second stage. 
So we have, uh, you know, um, the second stage variables, one per scenario, while the variables of the first stage, they should yeah, anticipate all scenarios and they are kind of scenario independent. It means that those variables, they are not indexed by scenario. So in the literature of stochastic programming, also we call first stage variables as here and now decisions. So it seems that they are anticipating for all scenarios. So here and now decisions, just it means first stage variables in the stochastic program. Good. And second stage variables, uh, we also can call it uh, wait and see decisions. So uh, we have to wait and see which uncertainty, I mean, how uncertainty realizes and to see which, which scenario, um, uh, yeah, which scenario is realized. If you remember, we already talked that in this uh, two-stage stochastic program, I'll elaborate more on, on that later in, in equations, but the first stage variables, they are complicating variables. What does it mean? It means that if we fix first stage variables and treat them as given values, it means that they can't uh, anticipate or, or we, are, we are not optimizing those variables anymore based on future scenarios. They are given, they are not variables anymore. If we fix first stage variables, then it looks like that we have a scissor and we are trying to disconnect this relationship between first stage and second stage variables. So what happens now we don't have a scenario three anymore. So now we have master problem here and we have one sub problem per scenario. Hope this illustration is, is clear and it's not confusing. Well, Sahan likes that. <laughs> yeah, it's Anna's figure. I can tell you it's, it's not my, yeah. The credit goes to, to Anna. So we have a set of sub problems, one per scenario, and we have one master problem. So always one master problem, but a set of sub problems, one per scenario. In previous example, it was one per hour. So what's going on? The master problem updates the value of complicating variables, which are given for sub problems. And then subproblems so provides the, uh, the values of sensitivities or dual variables to the master problem. That's how it works. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give a few examples later, but uh, before that, uh, what is the algorithm? The same. We have our original non-decomposed uh, two-stage uh, program. So we fixed the first stage variables. Then we got one sub problem per scenario. We check the convergence. If it's not converged, uh, we go next iteration. Uh, given sub sensitivities achieved from sub problems, we solve the master problem. And based on the master problem, we update the value of complicating variables. And then again, we go to the sub problem again. Uh, Brian asked, if you, do, if you do not have ramping, you can also decompose per hour, right? Yes, of course. Um, if you don't have intertemporal hours, yes. Um, yes, I mean, if, if you don't have ramping constraint or unicommitment constraint or storage, then yes, also it's decomposable per hour. But here let's focus on decomposition per, per scenario. It's scenario decomposition. Yeah, why not? Good. Applications of a two-stage stochastic program to energy system, you can find many, many, numerous number of applications, right? But some simple applications, for example, we can think of two-stage mar stochastic market clearing, right? Uh, day ahead and real time. Also, you can call real time, you can call it balancing stage. 
right? So balancing the stage, it could be real time or it could be intraday or whatever. So we can keep it generic. So we can think of stochastic market clearing as a two-stage stochastic program. We already saw it in lecture four, I guess, or five, sorry, five. Or example two, it could be a self-scheduling problem. Also, you can call it a offering problem, but in terms of quantity, not price, of a price taker producer, right? So it means that a price taker producer uh, forecast the future prices, the future market prices. They are given, but uncertain. So based on that, um, the, the price taker producer makes uh, production decisions, self-scheduling decisions, or you can call it quantity offer decisions. So the first stage, for example, it could be day ahead market and real time market. But more generally, you can think of that the price taker producer can uh, make bilateral contract decisions let's say week ahead or year ahead or whatever. And the second stage decisions, they are market decisions and the uncertainty is price. So for example, uh, at the beginning of a month, a price taker producer decides uh, how much of uh, its quantity should be sold based on bilateral contracts and the remaining uh, capacity or production should be uh, sold in the markets in the future markets. But we know that the price of those markets, when we are making uh, uh, contracting decisions, they are uncertain. Is it clear? Hope it's clear. Or the third example, again, could be uh, expansion decisions, right? So we have expansion stage and operational stage, like, like the, um, like, like the example we had in the beginning of this lecture, right? Very good. So you can also think of many, many other examples or yeah, applications of two stages stochastic program in power and energy systems or even in other fields. But if you write um, the two stage stochastic program in, in a compact form, it will look like this. We have first stage variables X, which is not indexed by scenario omega. And we have second stage wait and see uh, variables, uh, which are indexed by omega. We have first stage cost, like system cost in day at the stage, and uh, the expected second stage cost, where omega is the index for scenarios, pi omega is given as the probability assigned to each scenario, its parameter, and g of omega, g of uh, y omega is just um, the cost in the real time corresponding to scenario omega. Then we have first stage variable because only we have x, and also we have a linking constraint that links first stage and second stage variables. And we have one constraint, one linking constraint per scenario. So as I said, f of x is first stage cost, pi omega is probability. The, the whole this term is expected cost in the second stage, first stage constraint, and linking constraint. Of course, if k of x is equal to zero, it's just a constraint in the second stage. Yes, also if you like, you can add f of y omega is lower than or equal to c omega for each omega, but yeah, the linking constraint also represents it. So the linking constraint is more generic. Uh, Peter said, could F be F of omega, omega X? What do you mean, Peter? 
I can also be more, uh, be more specific. Now say that uh, F is just a multiplication of X with a price, but the price that is scenario dependent, but the X that is, you know, complicating variable. But then it's not first stage uh, cost anymore because we have uh, variables from the second stage, then you need summation for all omega and then uh, expected one. Yeah, true. Sorry. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Peter. Well, but at this, I think you answered my question. Okay, good. So remember, uh, vector x uh, contains all they had variables, and uh, it's our complicating variables. So we know already about that. So what is important is to formulate the master problem and sub problems per scenario. So I would like to give you two, three minutes and I hold the recording. Yeah, I, okay, let's uh, continue and uh, we will see the formulation in the next slide and then you can check if you uh, uh, derive the, the formulation correctly or not. You, you can use me if you want to. Yes, please. Then, then you can stop me if it's, if it's no, wrong. Please go ahead. Yes, of course. Uh, okay, so the master I would definitely minimize f of x and then you have this alpha i. As minimize f of x plus what? Alpha x. Yes. What we call alpha i. Yes, exactly. The, your variables? And uh, yeah, that would be an, uh, an X and um, an alpha Y. And alpha and, Y, very good. Yes. Subject to? Um, yeah, that depends on then if we start with the sub or the, or the master, but let's say we start with the master. So we will have this uh, lower bound minus big number on alpha I. Yes. And you will also have a, a lower bound on alpha i, which is then the the uh, the sum of the yeah the remaining sum of the second term in the original objective. Okay, alpha i is greater than or equal to what? The sum of omega pi omega g of y omega. In which um, iteration? Pardon? In which iteration? I or k? I. I. No k. k. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Very good. <laughs> and then plus um, lambda omega times lambda. the difference between x i and wait, x k. Wait. Lambda omega which iteration? K. Thank you. Then what? Uh, the diff parentheses the difference between x y and x k. X i and x k. But you have now one per omega. Can we leave it like, like it or, or we need some operator? We need the sum operator over omega, yeah. right? That covers, yeah, yes, yes, okay. right. yes. And K is between, is, is all uh, previous iterations from yeah. one to I minus one. Have you, yes. Did you miss something else? Any other constraint in the master problem? Anything from the original problem? Um, well, when you ask like that, the first, <laughs> the first constraint <laughs> is, thanks. Very good. This is the master problem. Very good. Uh, Yannick said uh, on the left-hand side of the Bender's cut, shouldn't it be superscript K plus one instead of I for all alpha? I didn't get Yannick, could you please unmute? Well, my question is if I add one Bender's cut per iter, I mean, this is a general question. If I add one gender Bender's cut per, per, uh, per iteration and I have like multiple constraints here, then on the left-hand side, it should be the, like the superscript of alpha, it should be the variable that is iterated over, right? Yeah, this one, right? Yeah, exactly. So shouldn't it's it be alpha? Superscript k plus one if k is the variable that is iterated. Oh no, k is not. I is the current iteration. K is just all the previous iterations. 
Yeah, exactly. But if I have in the master's problem in iteration I, I have all the previous bandwidth cuts as well, right? Yeah, but uh, but it's, it's the same. Alpha is always variable. If I put it K, it's, it's parameter. Alpha is always variable, right? Alpha in the current iteration, let's say iteration K, uh, three is bigger than, right? Let's say uh, the previous objective function after some problems, I call it just objective function in iteration one in iteration two, in iteration three, not three, sorry. No. Well, yeah, I get it. But I mean, like I, I build one constraint for K from one to I minus one, right? Yes. So when I have an I on the left-hand side, I mean, this doesn't make sense, right? Because it's an own, it should be an own constraint. No. Well, maybe we can talk later about that. Yeah, we can talk about it later, okay, but I don't, I don't agree. Anyway, Yannick, we can talk about it later. Uh, let's me see if there's another question. Direct is lambda omega a vector of length of x? Yes, exactly. Yes, definitely. Lambda is a vector, the same ve the same dimension as x. Exactly. Uh, the, 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 the direct did I answer? Lambda is a vector. If it's, if x is a vector, lambda is a vector. Good. Then it should be a lambda transpose. Uh, the the, the Priyanka said length of omega one per scenario. Yes. Ah, you you answered to Drake. Okay. Arno asked if we consider an expansion under uncertainty, do we get a three stage problem? Uh, yeah. If you go for expansion day ahead and real time, yes, then it's three three stage problem. Good. Uh, Peter, can I still uh, ask you to help me with the soup problem or not? You're done. I didn't forget me. <laughs> no, so I would say that we would then have omega sub problems. Omega, omega sub problem. Okay. What is the objective function? Uh, where you would minimize the, the, the G with regards to, um, to that omega. In which iteration? Uh, I. I. Yeah, OK, okay. thanks. Uh, do we need pi omega here or not? Pi omega. Would you put pi omega here, or, or you will not? Well, I guess it's uh, from that point of view, it's a constant. Yeah, it's it constant, but, but it's, it's, yeah, but it's a constant multiplied to. Yeah. It depending on the sign, so yeah, blah, blah, blah. I would put it there. Okay, let's put it there and then we will talk later. Okay, okay. pi omega, subject to- If it's a content, that's fine, but if it's a minus or a plus, it will depend on what the minimization does. Okay, what is the variable? Pardon? What What are the, our variables? Uh, that, that would be, uh, again, x, y, we'll come to that later, and then uh, y omega. And also xi, right? If you fix it later. Okay. Yes, exactly. Uh, our constraints? That will then be this uh, k at yeah, the last one, exactly. Yeah, in the iteration yeah. i. Yes. Plus l Plus. of y omega in iteration i, lower than or equal to b omega. You have yeah. per omega here. Yes. Then a fixing constraint, right? x y equals so to x i is equal to x fixed in iteration i whose dual variable is lambda, lambda. y in iteration good do you have any question to to peter <laughs> well it's, it's it's fully correct but i like to highlight something do we need here we need to consider probability definitely, right? If we put it there, our dual variable, does it see it or not? Is our variable weighted by pi omega or not? Yes, we have a lot of answers saying yes. So do we need to here again uh, multiply lambda in the Bender's cut by pi or not? No. 
since our lambda here already, uh, how to say, was impacted by pi, we don't need to again here multiply lambda by, by pi. But, but if you get to divide by the probability. Yes, but the other alternative is that you can eliminate pi omega from here, no problem. But here, instead of lambda, you need to also multiply it to pi omega. See how to cool it. Is it clear? Good. So both are equivalent. So let me, uh, yeah, I, I see the time is over. So let me continue a bit fast. So, so what we saw, maybe uh, it, will, it will take time. Maybe we can go for a break. <laughs> Let's have a 10 minute break. We will start again at 5, 10 p.m. So in 11 minutes, we will start again. So yeah, see you in 10 minutes. Okay, let's move on. Uh, I forgot to tell one thing. So when we remove probability from the objective function of the problem, of course, we need to multiply um, the sensitivity to, I mean, with, I mean, multiply by lambda, but we don't need this term anymore because this term is supposed to represent the objective function of the problem. And here we don't have probability in the subproblem. So this term can be eliminated if we eliminate pi omega from the objective function of the subproblem. Is it clear? Uh, good. Nice. Uh, so uh, based on the time, I, I see that uh, I, I will not manage to go for nested benders today. So I uh, we will talk about nested benders tomorrow. So yeah, the first half an hour of the lecture tomorrow, it will be nested benders. And then we will talk about Lagrangian relaxation. Any questions so far? Hope everything is clear. So um, just repeating what we did together. Um, we have one master problem and one sub problem per scenario from scenario one to the last scenario, let's say scenario N. So we have one sub problem per scenario. Um, the subprob sorry, the master problem provides the updated value for complicating uh, variable, while uh, the subproblems they send back uh, the values of let's say objective function, which is a function of omega, and sensitivity is left. Let's see how it is. So the, the formulation of all scenarios, they are identical, just for they are for different omegas. So here we assume, I mean, we go for the first option, we include probability of scenario in the objective function of the subproblems. And as Peter explained, uh, we have the linking constraint and fixing constraint, and that's it. And the formulation of uh, subproblem for all scenarios is equal. The only difference is that the given parameters B omega for different scenarios, it's different. And then the master problem, it includes the original objective function and the original constraint. And then the auxiliary variable that represents the uh, total objective function of all subproblems. Then if we go for master problem, we start with the master problem, we need a lower bound for the master for the alpha, the auxiliary variable, and we need benders. And as you see, pi appeared here, but not here, as we discussed. So this is exactly what Peter uh, formulated. So this is Bender's optimality cut. We are adding one cut per iteration. And 
The question is why doesn't the probability of scenario multiply this? So that's the same question we already talked. Why we don't have probability here? Because it already lambda sub pi omega in the in the subproblems. Good. So what we did here, as I said, the first option is that we include pi in the objective function of the subproblem. So lambda is probability weighted. So that's why here we don't have lambda, sorry, pi. But the other option is that we exclude, we, we don't include pi in the objective function of the subproblem. Then our dual variable uh, is not probability weighted. It means that we need to include it here. And this is a typo. We need to exclude it. Is it clear? If you write errors is, is, is clear, I can move on. Very good. Thank you. I uh, have to know that we, we, we reached uh, a convergence. Just checking upper and lower bound. The value of objective fun, the first, first stage cost is common. So it's, it's fine to either include or exclude it. Then, uh, the, 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 then, uh, uh, then uh, the uh, auxiliary variable alpha from the master problem, we need to, to compare its value with uh, the total objective function of all subproblems. If this difference is lower than or equal to epsilon, then with accuracy of epsilon, we got the convergence. So Liang just wrote in the chat box that I don't think that was a typo. Let's see. Why not Liang? This term is expected to represent. Yeah, if you look at the master problem, the uh, alpha value is supposed to represent the sum of all the yes 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 i think yes yes you're right you're right you're right alpha is expected to <clears throat> represent <clears throat> the original objective function which includes pi i'm sorry pi should be here yes i just yeah i confused you're right Liang. yes <clears throat> remember <clears throat> alpha is expected to uh, represent in the original objective function, uh, omega, alpha, sorry, pi omega times y of y, sorry, g of y omega. And here we have pi omega. Yes, you're right. You're right. Is, is everyone, I mean, under, yeah, thank you, Liang. So is everyone, uh, yes, So just Robert. to confirm then, if we don't have pi in the subproblem, then the lambda also needs to be multiplied by pi and therefore the, the pi w applies to the, or rather the sum is over the entirety of g plus the sensitivity. Exactly, this is slide is fully correct. So if we don't have pi here, our just lambda is not probability weighted. So we need to add it here. In any case, we need pi here because alpha represents expected cost. The other situ or uh, option is that we include pi here, then lambda is probability weighted, then we exclude it. Still, we need pi here. So in both forms, we need pi omega here. Is it clear, Prabhat and, and Sebastian? I think Sebastian asked, right? Good, or Drake, good. Okay, let's move on. So to sum up, uh, a stochastic optimization problem is decomposable. Complicating variables are first stage decision variables. So the number of subproblems, at least one per scenario. Also, you may manage to decompose more. For example, also one per hour, up to you. And we have expressed the Bender's algorithm in a generic linear, uh, for a generic linear stochastic optimization problem, and we use the compact form. 
And remember for a convex optimization problem, Bender's decomposition guarantees convergence to global optimality. Let's, uh, let's go for a real example, or I mean, the stochastic market clearing problem. Let, let's see how we can implement um, Bender's to stochastic market clearing that we had in lecture five. Uh, the same, almost the same example as the one we had in previous lectures, uh, two conventional generators, one inelastic load and one wind power. So G1 is fully inflexible in real time, while uh, G2 is fully flexible and the install capacity of wind is 70, production cost is zero. Four uh, scenarios with the same probability, 30, 60, 70, and 10. Uh, load, as I said, it's uh, in elastic and it's curtailment cost, let's say it's 80. So let's uh, solve this stochastic market clearing problem using vendors. You can use it as a step four of your course project. So remember we had this uh, uh, stochastic market clearing problem. Uh, our uh, variables are, they had variables or first stage variables. They are dispatch of generator G1 and G2 and wind power producer, all of them in the day at the stage. And let me change the color. And all of them, none of them, they are indexed by omega. They are first stage variables. Then we have a first stage cost, the operational cost of the system in the data stage, which is the generation cost of generator one and two. We assume wind power producer has zero cost. And also we have day head cost, sorry, day head constraints. Then in the real time, we have a set of second stage decision variables. Uh, four of them, they are uh, the adjustment variables of generator G2, just G2 because G1 is inflexible. Um, four variables for wind power spillage, one per scenario, and four variables for wind uh, load shedding, one per scenario. All of them, they are indexed by either S1 or S2 or S3 or S4. They are our four uh, scenarios. Then uh, here, there are the real-time constraints for scenario S1. So all of them, they are indexed by S1, the real-time uh, variables. Uh, yes. And 30 is the wind realization under scenario one. And uh, the real-time price is indexed by S1. And of course, we need similar constraints, real-time constraints for scenarios S2 to S4. So let's go for complicating variable. Uh, sorry, let's, uh, uh, yeah, as, 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 as we saw, the first stage variables, they are complicating variables. So the day at dispatch of generators and wind form, they are our three complicating variables. So the blue variables, they had variables, they are our complicating variables, we need to fix them. But let's see that word they, are, they, they, they appeared. They appeared in the objective function in all day ahead constraints, in the linking constraint in real time. It says that the total generation of all, I mean, the, the total generation of, of a unit is non-negative and lower than or equal to install capacity. And also the wind, day ahead wind dispatch appeared in real time power balance equality. G1, uh, the day head dispatch of G1 didn't appear in the real time constraints because it's fully inflexible. Is it clear so far? Are you now aware of the problem? If you say yes, I'll, yeah. So you're, you're following, very good. So first let's go for sub problem. So we have four sub problems here because we had four scenarios. Let's write the problem for scenario S1. 
And we need to have identical formulation of subproblems for scenarios two to four. So as you see still, we have the day ahead variables in iteration, let's say theta here, and all of them, they are fixed uh, to given values. Just to keep the generality, still we have the day ahead dispatch of generator one here, just to write a full formulation. Though that const that variable didn't appear at all in the subproblems because the corresponding generator is inflexible, right? So, of course, the day at constraints they are not gonna appear in the subproblem. They will be in the master problem. What we have as um, as constraints in the subproblem is the real time constraints. So here for generator two, the day ahead dispatch of generator two is given. It's a variable, but we have a fixing constraint. And also the same for, for wind day ahead dispatch appeared in the real time power balance equality. In this specific case, as I said, the day ahead dispatch of G1 didn't appear. So yeah, it's, it's corresponding dual variable rho will be definitely equal to zero because it's redundant. Is it clear? Is this a problem clear? Any question? Good. So we have one subproblem per scenario. What about the master problem? So in the master problem, our variables are day ahead dispatch decisions, three day ahead dispatch decisions, two for uh, generators G1 and G2, and one for wind power, and one, only one auxiliary variable per iteration. So though we have three complicating variables, still we have one alpha per iteration. So the objective function is the cost in the day ahead stage, and alpha. And alpha represents the expected system cost in real time. Then as constraints, we include our day ahead constraints, the generation limit of generators and wind farms. And also we include our day ahead power balance equality. And if we start with sub problem, we need to go for uh, we, we have to introduce a lower band for auxiliary variable alpha. Is it clear so far? If you write yes, I'll be very grateful. So all are following? Very nice. So now it's time to write Bender's cuts, right? We need to add Bender's cuts to to master problem. It looks a bit ugly, uh, but we will go one by one. So the first two uh, lines, they represent the total value of objective function of subproblems in previous iterations k. So in each scenario, so in uh, so so we have the probabilities for scenarios. They have the same uh, uh, what to say um, the same probability. So it's the production cost of generator two. It's adjustment cost in scenario one, plus in adjust plus in, in the same cost in, in scenario two, the same cost in scenario three, the same cost in scenario four. And all of them, they are weighted by 0 0.25 because our scenarios, they, are, uh, they have the same probability. The other term of cost in real time is load shedding. And again, we have the load shedding cost in all four scenarios. So these two lines, 
it gives just simply uh, the value of objective function of all subproblems. And as uh, Liang mentioned, of course, we need to have probability here. Good. What does this line show? Anyone can help me? What does the next three lines show? This line, this line, and this line. What are they? Maybe one volunteer can unmute. Peter says they come from the fixing constraints. Exactly, Peter. So why do we have three lines here, Peter? You're fixing three variables? Yes, exactly. So we have three uh, complicating variables, so three lines in, in the master, sorry, in the Bender's cuts. So uh, the first complicating variable is the um, uh, generation dispatch of G1 in the current iteration minus the same value, but in the previous iteration. The blue one is variable, the black ones, they are parameters. And what is this, Peter, this term? Well, then that's the sum of all the tools from, yeah, the different uh, scenarios. Very right, exactly. Do we need to it's multiply this uh, summation by 0 0.25? <laughs> well, that depends on what you did in the sub problem. Exactly. In the sub problem, we had 0 0.25 in the objective function. Let me just check. Yeah, yes, we, we had it here, right? Yes. So we don't need it anymore there, exactly. And the same story for the next two uh, complicating variables, right? Very good. Is there any question so far or is it clear? The Bender's cut, the formulation of Bender's cut. Yeah, Sahand and Marin says they are clear. Peter, Jemima, they say they are clear and a lot. Albert, Nora, Priyanka, good. Carolina, very nice. Good. So if we solve uh, the Bender's decomposition algorithm, this is what Anna did. Uh, we will get exactly the same solution as um, if we solve the problem directly without decomposition. So we are not gonna expect to get a different solution than non-decomposed model or solution. So this is what Anna did when she was teaching this lecture. So upper band and lower band, uh, the lower band comes from master problem, upper band comes from the sub problems. So as you see, after five iterations, we, we got convergence. And the master problem provides the lower bound and sub problem provides the upper bound. Good. Jalong, quick yes. question. Yeah. Didn't you say earlier that the upper bound and the lower bound should increase monotonously? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think I was wrong. No, no, it's not the case. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, no, it's not the case. Uh, what I was should say is that lower band and upper band, they should not cross each other. If they cross each other, there is something wrong or the original problem is non-convex. So mm -hmm. it was what I was intending to say. No, but okay. there is no reason to say always there are monotonically uh, they are increasing or decreasing, but they should not cross each other. For example, it should not be something like that. The lower band is something like this, while upper band is something like this, but still they are diverging. Okay, yes, then, I can then we can say, actually drop that absolute value from the, uh, yeah. from the master problem. So I class asked, uh, their difference decreases monotonically? I guess so. 
I guess so. If if the difference doesn't uh, change, I mean, doesn't reducing, is not reducing uh, in a monotone way, then um, it means that our cut, our bender's cut, our new cuts, uh, they are not working well. So I suppose the difference should should reduce in a monotone way. Clear? Yes. Okay. Any questions so far? Hope it's clear. Good. So far, what we talked about, it's a traditional vendors or classical vendors, let's say not traditional, classical vendors that you also call it single cut. It means that in each iteration, you are adding only one additional cut. But in the literature of vendors decomposition applied to stochastic programming mostly, there is also um, a technique called multi-cut benders decomposition. So if I'm not wrong, this is the first paper from John Birch and his colleague uh, who proposed multi-cut algorithm for two-stage stochastic linear program published in 1988. Also, to be honest, I found also this paper from you and uh, Grossman, very interesting. It's again about applications of Bender's decomposition for, uh, for a two-stage stochastic program. But before talking about what, ben what multi-cut Bender's is, do you have any, let's say guess, initial guess what it will be? Any idea? What do you imagine it should be multi-cut benders? Brian says you add multiple cuts in one iteration. Yes, fair enough. How many cuts? Neuron says we add one cut per iteration, now multiple. Yes, definitely. But how many? 10 cuts, 20 cuts, 1 million cuts. How many one cuts? Scenario. One per scenario. Yeah, yeah, one per scenario, not one per uh, complicating variable. One, one per scenario. Okay, so it means that instead of uh, generating a single cut based on all sensitivities of subproblems, each subproblem generates its own Bender's cut in the master problem. So you have cut as many uh, as, many, uh, as uh, the number of subproblems. Let's see. So in the single cut, what we had so far, uh, we had one Lambda per scenario one sensitivity uh, per, per scenario achieved from subproblem. Then we had only one additional cut in each iteration. It means that we have, as you see, it's a single alpha, single value or single variable alpha. And we have the summation for all scenarios. But before going next, a slide, can you help me how we can make it multi-cut benders? Do I need to change the problem to generate multiple cuts? Is there any change in the problem? What about master problem? Should I change something to make it multi-cut? Yannick says, no sums, but multiple constraints in the master. Yes. Saurabh says, would you have an alpha for each scenario? <laughs> yes, that's, that's the point. Exactly, Saurabh. Hosna, no, just change alpha. Okay, let's first answer this question. Should I do something with the problem or I can leave it as it is? Okay, Peter says, leave it. I agree. I leave it as it is. 
Good. Now with master problem, as uh, so our upset, we need now one alpha per omega. So now alpha omega represents the value of objective function of corresponding uh, corresponding uh, scenario. So can I leave it as it is or I need sum over omega? Exactly, Priyanka. We need sum over omega. Very nice. So by the way, I forgot to put alpha here. So we have alpha omega i. So we have alpha omega for all omega, alpha omega. And since we have alpha omega, it's clear that we will have alpha omega, one cut per scenario. Right? What about this part? Do I need to change something? Uh, Hosna say, uh, many one says remove uh, uh, some operator. Okay, I remove some operator and done, right? That's it. Uh, Priyanka says remove pi. Do I? Remember here, alpha represents pi times g. So I don't think we need to remove pi. I think we have to leave it as it is. Good, let's see what the answer is. Oh, it's here. Exactly. So, so in the multicut, we have one alpha per omega. Again, we need to add alpha, alpha as a variable here. So we need uh, alpha omega. Then we remove the sum operator and we have multiple cuts per iteration to be added in each iteration. Good. Is it clear so far what we did with multi-cut vendors? Nice. Yes, we talked about this, yeah. If we go for our problem, our original two-stage stochastic program, so problems are unchanged, nothing to do here. So here, uh, our master problem uh, takes one alpha per omega and summation the objective function. So no sum operator anymore, and that's it. One cut per scenario to be added in each iteration. Yeah. And uh, for convergence, again, I would say that now we need to get convergence. Well, it, it's a bit tricky what the convergence is here. Do we need to get convergence in every single scenario or in expectation? Yeah, Peter asked that. And convergence test is with respect to sum of alphas. I would say for sum of alphas, but we have to run it, to be honest. I, I think it should be for all alpha. If we go for all alphas, just one uh, stop criterion, then it's uh, less restricting. Yes, it's expectation, exactly. But if we go for multiple criteria for stopping, it means that every single scenario they have to converge, uh, then uh, I don't know how many iterations we need to get that point. So maybe having one stop criteria will be enough, but we have to implement it and see it. Good. Yeah, there was a slide that I think I removed it, but I can tell it um, orally. Um, any idea about um, benefits and limitations of single cut versus multi-cut? Peter says, do you want us to do multi-cut? Up to you, it's your choice. You can go either to single cut or multi-cut. Uh, it's, it's your choice. 
Good. So let's back to our discussion. Uh, Multicut or Unicut, what should we go for? Let's talk first about the potential benefits. Do you see any benefit out of Multicut? Is it, is it nice? If the sub problems have already converged, can you stop running them? Yeah. Yes, Sahan says that it's more tight if we go for multi-cut. Akila says memory requirements versus computational burden. Okay. The good thing is that with multi-cut, if we have, I don't know, 10 scenarios, so instead of having one additional cut in Bender, in, in master problem, we will add 10 new um, additional cuts. So if our cuts, I mean, if it works well, we may get convergence way faster than, than Unicut, right? That's the advantage. But here, in my opinion, also there is, a, a, let's say, a threat. If one of the problems, they provide not very efficient cut for any reason, if we are adding one inefficient cut to our master problem and it will be remained there, so maybe we are also compromising convergence. So we are adding one cut per scenario, but we have to make sure that these cuts, they, they have a good quality. They are not compromising uh, the convergence and the solution. That's my experience. So uh, maybe for our implementation, we can get uh, convergence way faster if we go for multi-cut. If not, it's good to get back to our original single cut. Why? What is the threat of multi-cut? Do you see any potential threat or limitation for multi-cut? Franka says convergence. What about dimension wise? Osna says let lots of variables. Yes, we need one alpha per omega. So if we go for 1 million scenarios, it means that we are adding one mil, we, we have 1 million alpha in our master problem. What about constraints? How many const, if we have 100 scenarios, how many, how many constraints we are adding in each iteration? 100. It means that in tens iteration, if we didn't get convergence yet, how many constraints, benders, benders cut constraints we have? Thousand. And if we go to 100 uh, iterations, we have 10,000 constraints. So master problem, the dimension of master problem grows exponentially. Exactly. While in, in a single cut, the number of uh, constraints, the, the size of master problem grows linearly as a function of the number of iteration, while in the case of uh, multi-cut, it's not the case. So this is my impression. If with multi-cut, we are lucky to get the solution very fast in a few iterations, very good. But if we go for, I don't know, um, a large number of iterations, then uh, multi-cut will become very uh, tricky because the master problem, its, its dimension is growing very fast. We did the composition to get rid of large scale problems. Now our master problem grows faster. David asked, what options are there to check the quality of your cuts? Uh, the easiest option is that if you see that your lower band or upper band, especially your lower band, if it is stuck and it's not increasing, you are not uh, uh, reducing the difference, it means that there is something wrong or not well functioning with cuts, right? So always I, I suggest that you, you see, you monitor the progress of lower band and upper band. If for example, the upper band is like this, but lower band is stuck something like this. 
it means that our additional cuts in each iteration, they are not adding much information to the master problem, right? So the ideal is that the master problem in every iteration, it gets closer uh, to, the, to the upper bound. Brian said, could you talk about your experience regarding how much does the speed improve using vendors and parallel computation? Um, you're talking about vendors in general, right? Not multi-cuts, Brian. Yeah, vendors in general and also multi-cuts. Have you, like, how much does the speed increase? You use parallel computing. My, my PhD thesis was about investment problem. And I had simply some uh, problems that without vendors, it didn't work out. It, it, it was fully uh, computationally intractable. So it, it's not about speed uh, and convergence or, or computational time. It's about the uh, tractability. At, at least it was the case in my, uh, the problem of my PhD thesis, right? So vendors made my problem computationally tractable. It still it took one day to be solved. But at the end of the day, I had the solution. But with direct solution, no way, no chance. But for simpler problems, <clears throat> it depends. Maybe uh, vendors take more time than direct solution because vendors needs several iterations. But if the direct solution is fast, then it's fast, right? Then about multi-cut, my, my, uh, my former student, Anna, tried it. And I, I remember she was very happy with multi-cut. But, but again, um, I, I don't remember how much faster, how fast it was multi-cut in, in her application to unicut. But I think it's very case dependent. It depends how many scenarios we have and how fast the dimension of master problem is growing. So, so you would say that maybe the, the main advantage is that it makes the problem computationally tractable. With vendors? Yeah. Yes, definitely. Than, than, than the speed. Okay. No, I, I don't say that. I, okay. I say, I mean, in my application, it was the case of tractability. But also you may have very big problems. It, it still can be solved but it takes a very long time. Then if you decompose it, and if you solve it in a few iterations, then it may take, um, uh, it, it may, it, you, you might be able to solve it faster. All right, okay, thank you. Uh, Peter said, but uh, it is the same problem, vendors or not? Uh, Peter, what, what, what's the question? I think I kind of figured it out because what you do is with your use vendors, you search in subspaces in the sub problems and then you combine. So in that sense, it's faster than just searching in the entire space all the time. Yes. Because what, what I was confused about is that, you know, it is the same problem. If you use vendors to composition or, or not, I guess, I hope that you, it's the same problem you have formulated. But this way of thinking of it, like you search just in smaller subspaces and then combine yeah, I'm fine, thanks. Lysandros asked, uh, if we apply vendors to a stochastic problem where only the first stage includes binary variables, then vendors ensures optimality, for example, the unit commitment problem? Uh, I would say, yeah, I, my, okay. I, um, my, my answer here is that not necessarily Yes, our subproblem is linear. So let, let me explain uh, Lisandro's question to everyone. Yeah, here. If we have MILP problem, mixed integer linear program, and if we decompose it to MILP for master problem, it means that in the first stage problem, we have binaries, but in the second stage, uh, the subproblems the subproblems are a linear program. Can we implement vendors? Yes, because our subproblem that we need to drive sensitivities, it's LP, has continuous feasible space. So we can implement vendors, no problem. If our subproblem also had binaries, we could not because we need binary variables. And when there is 
binary, sorry, we need dual variables. And if there is, bi uh, we, if there is binaries, we can't derive it. So if we can, the, if the question is that, can we implement um, your uh, vendors to this problem? The answer is yes. Does it guarantee convergence to global optimality um, in doubt? And I would say not necessarily because the original problem with respect to complicating constraint, it may have non-convex envelope or discrete envelope. So we have to check it out. So I would not say directly that, yeah, okay, here benders converge to global optimality necessarily. Lisandros, did I answer your question? Yeah, sorry for interrupting you. So if you have a MIMT with, with 1,000, binary variables, then you need to plot, you need to make sure that with respect to each binary variable, you have an embed, a convex embed of that, right? Your complicating variable is, is binary? Yeah, and you have 1,000 binary variables. Yes, I would, yes, I would say so, yeah. So you would need to plot each of them. Yeah, but here, uh, Lisandro's question is that um, the complicating constraint variable here, I don't think it's it's binary. But, but we have to check it out, right? But again, I'm repeating, you can apply vendors to this problem. It works, yeah. But at the end of the day for me, it most likely it's a heuristic. It means that we can't mathematically guarantee convergence to optimality. Good. Sand asked, what uh, was your thesis problem LP and is still intractable? No, it was bi-level problem. It was MILP. Uh, yes. Marin asked, uh, did Anna use benders for her studies on gas networks? Uh, no. No, she used benders for her master thesis, actually. Uh, the, 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 no, she didn't use benders in her PhD thesis. Abolf has asked, what was your solution if lower bound is not increasing so much as the iteration increases? Uh, I would say we need more efficient cuts. One could be multi-cuts, one option, right? And yeah, this is exactly what I'll talk about, adaptive strategy. What else? Um, yeah, in, in my past research, I did some some tricks, but all of them, they are heuristics. So if the lower bound is not increasing as you wish, it means that the information flow between subproblem and master problem is not very good. So you have to think how you can increase the information to be exchanged uh, from, or to be uh, uh, transferred from subproblem to the master problem. Uh, sometimes you can do some some tricks in your specific problem. I did, but it, it's it's really hard to explain what it is because it was very case specific. Uh, also, you have to think how to increase the quality of vendors cuts. One option is multi cut. Um, what other options are? Uh, I I really suggest this paper. Uh, it's a review paper about benders. I saw that they uh, proposed and, I mean, not proposed, they reviewed a lot of improved variants of benders. And most of them, they are based on improving, uh, Im improving uh, benders cut, benders cut. So I, I suggest you, you check this paper. Also, um, there is a paper from uh, Rusichniski's group from 1988. Also, I used it uh, some often. It was very nice. Sometimes your upper bound is something, I mean, it, it's like a zigzag. It may happen if you implement benders to a, for example, milk problem or non-convex problem. Again, it's heuristic, but you may see this behavior. So in that paper of Rusichniski's group, um, that paper explains how we can add a regularizer term, a regularizer term uh, to, to subproblems 
that makes the upper bound a bit smoother. It takes a bit more iterations, but the lower bound profile, it becomes a bit more, I mean, smoother. Um, yes, hope, uh, yeah, I, I, I shared enough experience from, yeah. Carolina asked, multi-cuts work for any problem with multiple sub-problems? I would say so, yes. You can generate. Oh, okay, let me also say something. Okay, so with multi-cut, what we are doing, we are generating one cut based on each sub-problem, right? This is what, uh, what uh, multi-cut vendors does. Also, I saw some papers that they generate not one cut per subproblem, but one cut per cluster of subproblems. Then the question is that how to cluster subproblems? Is it clear? For example, we have 100 subproblems. So by unicut, we generate one cut. With multicut, we generate 100. So maybe there might be some intermediate option that we I don't know, uh, generate 20 cuts. It means that we need to cluster some problems. Is it clear what I'm saying? Very good. Let me continue the questions in the chat box. Carolina, uh, yeah. So hopefully, Caroline, I, I, I answered your question. I mean, the, the subproblems could be one per scenario, one per hour, or whatever. So yeah, it could, it could be anything. Then uh, Abulfaz said, what is our problem if our subproblem has binary? No, no, well, we can't use vendors. That, that's the clear answer. So uh, there are other approaches that I didn't cover I'm not going to cover in this course. There is something, for example, called primal benders. Uh, it's a bit tricky approach. It's like, uh, yeah, you need to come yeah, duplicate a lot of um, um, subproblem so constraints in the master problem, but it's also an approach. It may work if your subproblems so has binaries. Uh, what else? Yeah, that's that's the one approach comes in my mind. Also, I saw some papers in about nested benders, but it's kind of a benders. Uh, when they generate uh, sensitivities, they relax binaries, and then uh, they fix it. Then then when they don't need uh, the dual variables, I mean, they they treat binaries as they are, but all of them, they are heuristics, right? Hope uh, I, I gave you some hints, um, Abelfaz. Yes, Abelfaz, exactly. The primal vendor is, is almost the same as CCG, column and cut generation. Uh, also, there's another approach based on column generation. It's dancing wolf decomposition. It, also, you can use it if subproblems um, are mixed integer. Sebastian asked, how would vendors make a large problem more tractable? Surely the iterating is more costly than a direct central solution. We don't know, Sebastian, if we get converge uh, in, five, in five iterations, 10 iterations, maybe we are lucky. Or if you assume we have, I don't know, 1 million scenarios, 1 billion scenarios, I don't think even if it's LP, I don't think the direct solution will be fast. The reason I ask is because uh, you mentioned your, your thesis and I checked your thesis. Um, I mean, I, I only read obviously in the introduction part where you explain what happens in the chapters and uh, you mentioned that you you took the impact and you um, you made a mulp out of it by the process you explained to us. I think that part makes sense. But then you said that you improved the tractability using banders, and that's it. Just doesn't intuitively make sense to me. So I assume there's an explanation because for the little example that we solved for the exercise now, 
Benders is 10 times slower. So my my in my PhD thesis without benders, the problem was not solvable. It it was totally intractable. But my question is what how does benders make it easier? Because the iterating itself isn't faster. So it must have done something else. Uh, no, okay. Uh, you're asking about my thesis, which I'm okay, but I, I can explain. Um, yeah, again, yeah, I, I have to remember, but uh, yeah, if if we in my thesis, if we fix the expansion decisions, mm -hmm. then we have one problem, one sub problem per scenario per let's say per day or per representative day or something like that. Mm -hmm. So you decompose the original problem to many, many sub problems and then you can solve sub problems separately. But the problems are still linked by banders, right? Of course. Yeah, but then you still have to iterate each of those little solutions. So what I'm thinking is that the computational burden should still increase because you have to make all those many cuts between all the sub solutions. So I just don't definitely understand why it becomes faster or better or more tractable. No, I, I'm not saying it's faster. The original problem, you can't solve it at all. It's, I mean, you, you start solving and you'll see that, uh, I mean, after two days, 10 days, your code is still running and nothing happened. With benders, since you uh, decompose the problem to smaller problems, it's just smaller problems is easier to solve. Yes, it takes a lot of iterations, but at least after, I don't know, 20 iterations, 30 iterations, you get convergence. So it may take one day, two days to get convergence, but you have solutions at the end of the day. Yeah, but I mean, that means that it's faster. If the other one doesn't solve it all, then, then this one is faster. I don't call it faster. I call it tractable. It's solvable. The first one without the composition, it's not solvable. The other one is solvable. How long does it take? Well, that's the second question. Maybe we can uh, talk about this more after after mm. the lecture because still I, I'm not finished the lecture. Um, the last thing is the adaptive strategy that, let me see if I answered all questions in, in, in the chat box. If not, I'll answer it after the lecture because I see the time is over. Uh, the last thing that uh, I saw, uh, it, it could be interesting, but again, it's kind of heuristic, is that there is something called Bender's decomposition with adaptive strategy. It's a simple idea. It says that uh, for some few first uh, scenarios, let's say for first 10 scenarios, sorry, first 10 iterations, Y10, well, it's a try and error, maybe 12, maybe 15, go for a multi-cut. If you get convergence, that's great. If not, it seems that your master problem is growing fastly. Then from iteration 10 or 12 or whatever you decide, switch uh, back to single cut. And uh, they called it adaptive strategy. And there are the three papers I found in the literature that they use this trick. Does it make sense? Adaptive strategy. Is it clear what it is? Good. Yes, again, that's my suggestions uh, to read about, uh, I mean, the other, I mean, the different variants of benders. Um, read, read this paper, it's, it's a nice uh, review paper. Well, I would like to conclude the session now because the time is over but I'm available here to answer any questions about vendors or anything else. So let me stop recording. So see you.